Hey there, welcome back to the Path to Zion podcast where we are rediscovering the ancient way. You can always find us over at pathtozion.com or of course on YouTube. Um, and you can reach out to us at Path to Zion podcast at gmail.com. Look, it has been a few weeks again. We traveled for a little bit and went out of town. And uh, if I'm a little bit rusty here at first, that's what happens if I have weeks between recordings. Um, just real briefly before we get to today, I have a very lengthy study that's ongoing talking about biblical unity and just asking the question, um, what is it? And so I want to put that out there in, into your your um, considerations uh, of just a, a depositing a question as we move towards answering that question according to the word here in maybe a few days. Um, what is biblical unity and how do we get there? How do we find what it is? How do we walk in it? And um, how do we even know if it's attainable today? So that's kind of on the back burner here. And that's, I think we're 14 pages in. Um, but this, this morning, I just woke up. I was just reading some stuff in the Word, and, and this led to this, led to this, led to this. Um, and next thing you know, I'm just typing out what became this, probably a two-part series, what we're going to tackle today. And I titled it, How to Become a Man of Faith, The Account of Abraham Offering Isaac. And, and, and most of all of us who, who, even if you're not really seasoned in the Bible or, or, or do Bible study or anything, you have heard about this account. You've heard about this record um, of this historical event of, of two individuals, a father and a son, facing a very difficult and trying circumstance, a very challenging um, request from Yahweh for them. And, and so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about it um, hopefully a little bit deeper than, than what we have heard for most of our lives. Um, most of us, as I've said, are, are familiar with the account, but we just kind of casually read it, and we may think towards it to a certain extent, um, but do we really sit and examine the details? And how, how did Abraham become a man who did this act with his his, his son, the gift that he was given from Yahweh. How in the world did he get to that point? And, and I believe there is an answer. Um, and I'm going to present that for your consideration because if we just simply throw up our hands and say, well, that's just a man of faith for you, amen, bless God, we miss the whole point. Um, you're going to hear me be redundant with several phrases throughout this, and, and so, so just be mindful of that. It, it is for a purpose to help us associate something different to this biblical record of a father and a son, to help drive out just the topical man of faith understanding, we're going to more examine, well, how did he get there? How did he become this man of faith that was exercised greatly um, when he was asked to offer his son? And so let's just hit the main points here for a little bit of a preface of where we're headed. Um, four of them specifically, one is somewhat broad, but Abraham, of course, yes, he was a man of faith. We know that. Everybody knows that. Um, even in other faiths, Abraham is highly um, viewed and esteemed. Um, but how do we know? How do we know that, uh, that Abraham was a man of faith? Faith today in 2023 in a general Christianity belief system tells us that faith is this, this inward posture of your heart. It's this somewhat nebulous place that only you and God know. God knows your heart, and so be a man of faith. Um, but how do we know, whether we talk about all the individuals found in Hebrews chapter 11, or those who, are, or who aren't even mentioned there but are men of faith in the, in the biblical sense, um, but of course, specifically to Abraham, how do we know that he was a man of faith? Well, evidence, okay? Fruit, actions, deeds, things that he did revealed the posture, the inner place condition of his heart. Um, literal actions revealed that he was a man of faith. And he is the father of that faith, okay, that is been passed down general, generationally to Yahweh's people. Um, so despite what we've been told, despite what we've inherited, biblical faith has never only been a matter of the heart. Okay, 
and we could go through a, a lengthy list of, of main Bible characters that, that we could um, just read the text alone that identify and qualify these men as being men of faith or women of faith. It was never only a heart matter. Why? Because we have to be shown evidence of a life that shows the inward reality of being a man or a woman of faith. I mean, this is not complex. Um, it was demonstrated by righteousness, living righteousness out in your life. Righteous deeds, actions, acts, works, okay? That was the evidence of faith. It is not faith, okay? <laughs> but it is the fruit on the tree of a man of faith. Then and only then, when, when there's this outward expression of our faith, do we know if you truly possess it? No one will know if we are people of faith if it is not exercised to look like something out here. Okay? And I would say, without going down that road, that's part of the main problem within modern doctrines of, of Christianity is we've not allowed our faith to really look like anything. We've not allowed it to propel us to, to speak differently, to act differently, to live a, a different lifestyle, literally, because we are living with a faith and a hope in a, an Elohim who gives us things to do, expectations upon us, as this account is clearly um, telling us about. Now, there are endless types and shadows that point to Yeshua, Within this text, we will touch on a few, not all. There are many um, that are illustrations, if you will, examples that, that literally point us to Yeshua's function and, and his interaction with the Father. Um, it's pretty, pretty interesting imagery. Um, number three, because Abraham obviously knew Yahweh, I believe that he knew Yahweh would not go against his own ways and demand the life of Isaac. This is going to be one of our main points about how to become a man of faith is found within this that I just read that I will read again. Because Abraham knew Yahweh, I believe that he also knew Yahweh would not go against his own ways and demand the life of Isaac. Okay? We will look at many scriptures that promote this idea. Please, let, we're going to pull over on that for quite some time and talk about that, because that is an integral part of, of the whole and the, and the real crux of why I'm even um, sharing this today. And this leads us to number four, which is to our title's point, okay? The title of this series' main point is this. A man of faith has become a man of faith not because of blind trust, but because he knows his Elohim. Please hear me. This is the main point of why I would share this out of Genesis chapter 22 today. A man of faith has become that. He's become that man of faith, not because of merely blind trust, not because of just ignorance and, well, I don't know any details. I don't know anything. I don't know what God's doing. I'm just trusting the Lord. No, I believe, according to biblical texts and historical writings towards these men of faith, women of faith, they knew what they were being told to do in many ways. Now, a lot of times with Abraham, to be clear and to be full and fair, start walking, Abraham. Just start going. Well, where am I going? Well, no wonder about that. Go on. Yes, there are many times we don't know details. There's many times we don't know specifics. Yes, I don't doubt that at all. Yahweh's ways are above mine. His thoughts are so much higher than my thoughts. Yes and amen. Praise the Father, that's true. Yes, I'm not, we're not disagreeing with any of those things. or within the principle of knowing every detail. But what we are going to promote is that we must know Yahweh. We must know that he never changes. We must know that his um, covenants are sure from his end. We must know that his commands, his ways, when he says this is blue, this is blue. You know what I'm saying? And so if he comes to me and tells me, if he tells me that this is blue, and in and, and 10 years from now something comes to me 
and it seems like he's telling me this is red, I have to go back and remember, well, he told me this was blue. There's something here maybe I don't understand. There's something that I have to investigate because this seems to promote a different fact and truth than what Yahweh has already established and what he's already told us, if that makes sense. But to our point exactly, Abraham knows Yahweh's character, okay? He intimately knows his Elohim. He knows that Yahweh will not operate outside of the boundaries of his own law. He knows that Yahweh never changes. Yahweh always keeps his promises, which is an integral part into the offering up of Isaac because of all the promises that Isaac embodied. Because of this, okay, because of these facts, Yahweh's never changing. He is trustworthy. He is entirely true. When he speaks something, he will not transgress his own law. Because of these things, Abraham can become a man of faith in this circumstance that we're going to read here in Genesis 22 in just a moment. And this is good for us to examine and apply to our own lives. Why? So we can ask this question, according to a biblical pattern today, specifically Abraham, how do we become men of faith? Okay. Now, according to Genesis chapter 22, we see this really, it's a complex situation. There's not much text here, um, but there's so many details within this account, if we scrutinize it, that we'll miss if we don't just stop and study or at least slow down enough to ask some questions about what we're told and the events that unfolded um, in, this, in this very small amount of text. It's surely more than what we've been taught in most cases. Now, there are men who have taught upon uh, may, many, many layers of this. Some of them I remember listening to years ago, even though I can't recall many details. I know that there are men who have dug this out and in, in, in commentaries and things of, of that nature. But as a whole, we are told Abraham was given a son. He was given a promise through the son. Yahweh demanded the life of the son. Abraham was a man of faith, so he goes up to surrender the life of the son. God provides a ram for a replacement. The son and the father go home. Amen. Okay? Now, that, of course, is, is barely even scratching the surface, but we kind of move past and we just keep, keep on going to something else. Man, Abraham was such a man of faith. I could never do that. And how do you kill your own son and embrace the fact that he had to do that? Well, I don't think it's that simple. I think there's a lot more at play here that Abraham knew. Again, to our point, Abraham knew. Okay, does this line up with who Yahweh is. Does this line up with his character? Does this line up with his commands? Does this line up with what Yahweh said is pleasing in his sight that he can receive and be worshipped according to? Does this fit the pattern of who Yahweh is? Okay, and that's what we're asking here today um, in measure. Now, we're going to talk on many layers of this, um, but not all. This is not exhaustive, but we, we are going to read many. Now, I should have wore my glasses today. I have bifocal contacts, but man, I just cannot read up close. So if I look like an old man, I'm sorry. We're going to read, we're going to kind of breeze through the text. We'll, we'll, we'll have to figure it out as we go. Will we read it in its entirety or not? I don't know. So we'll see. This is Genesis chapter 22. It came about after these things that Yahweh tested Abraham. And he said to him, okay, so even that, do we have to pause it every sentence? Maybe. He's testing Abraham, okay? He's not giving Abraham a command to just go and do this. From the very beginning, the, the author is making it clear this is a test for Abraham. Okay. Now, we could say at, at that time, we don't know. Abraham didn't know, speculatively. Is this going to be an actual offering? You know, am I going to have to kill my son? We'll get to that. And so it's very interesting from the very beginning, Yahweh tests Abraham and calls out to him by name, Abraham. And Abraham says, here I am. Oh man, I, 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 I thought towards this a lot when I was compiling these pages this morning, just about that. I was comparing him alongside um, Adam hiding in the garden. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Hey, hey, uh, Adam, wh where'd you go? 
we're supposed to meet here today. Why aren't you here? Why aren't you responding? Hey, here I am, Father. Okay, Abraham, he did do that. Here I am, he says quickly to Abraham, to uh, Yahweh calling his name. Verse 2, he, Yahweh, said, Take now your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split wood for the burnt offering. And he arose and went to the place of which Yahweh had told him. Instant obedience. This is the Shema understanding. If you hear Yahweh's voice, you obey him. There's a problem with your hearing if you're not obeying. Abraham was the father of faith because of this example. He heard and he obeyed. If he didn't obey, he didn't hear correctly. Okay? He wasn't listening. A lot of times we can hear many things, but we're not listening. There is a difference. We talk to our son about that all the time. Verse 4, on the third day, interesting, Abraham raised his eyes and he saw the place from a distance. He sees where they're headed, okay? After three days' journey, and Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go yonder and will worship and will return to you, okay? Interesting phrase, is it not? We're going to dissect some of this here in a moment. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Verse 7, Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, son. Okay, quick response again. I'm right here, son. I'm right here. Okay, like, do we understand this? I'm right here, son. I'm right here, Yahweh. I'm right here, Isaac. Don't, don't be afraid. I'm right here. Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said in verse 8, God, Yahweh, will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. Okay? Pretty hard phrase right there. Man of faith, you better believe it. But again, why? Why was he full of faith? Then they came to the place of which Yahweh had told them, and Abraham built the altar there, and arranged the wood, and bound his son Isaac, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand, and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of Yahweh called to him from heaven, and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, What? Here I am. You see this pattern? He's attentive, friends. He's paying attention to what's going on. Verse 12. He, Abraham, said, I'm sorry, he, the angel, Do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him, for now I know that you fear Elohim, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his thorns, and Abraham went, and he took the ram, and he offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day. Jehovah Jireh, you have probably heard. In the mount of Yahweh, it will be provided. Then the angel of Yahweh called to Abraham the second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares Yahweh, because you've done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, Indeed, I will greatly bless you and greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. And in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. And then they return exactly as Abraham had said they would. Okay, so let's just examine this and tiptoe through it just a little bit. Because, again, there's so many details within this. Let's talk about verse 5 real quick. Okay, 22.5. Abraham said to his young men. Okay, first of all, we have to realize there was a, a, a command that came, a testing that came from Yahweh to Abraham and said what? Take your son. Let's just read it word for word so I don't mess anything up. Take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, no wondering who, Go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on the mountain. Pause, okay? 
clear instruction. Take your son up the mountain where I tell you and take his life as an offering. Okay? But here we are in verse 5, right after this. Abraham's already moved in obedience. He's already gone out. He's already got up early in the morning, and he is confidently fulfilling Yahweh's command. Instant movement. Okay? So they're going out, he and his men and his son, of course, and they're going out, and on the third day, they see this destination from a distance, and Abraham tells his, his young men who were with him, Stay here. Me and Isaac are going off. We're going to worship, and we're going to return. Now let's put verse 5 alongside verse 2. Yahweh says, go and kill your son. Verse 5, Abraham tells his servants, we'll be back in just a little bit. Me and my son both. We're going up to worship Elohim. Wait a minute. So we have to ask the question. And this is what I want to challenge you to do when you read the Word. If you don't already, many of you do, I know. Is Abraham defying Yahweh's command? Is he disagreeing with what Yahweh said? Go up the mountain, take the life of your son, kill him, sacrifice him to me as a burnt offering. And then, right immediately, three days later, Abraham defies, seemingly, what Yahweh instructed to come back down with his son, which he could not do if he had offered him as a sacrifice as Yahweh tested him to do. Okay? Worship in return. <laughs> Yahweh doesn't seem to correct Abraham at all. We don't see any allusion to that at all in the Word. So there's obviously more going on to this than a casual read, okay? So by the time they get to the pre prescribed place and they build an altar, pause, why are they building an altar? This is way before Mount Sinai. There's burnt offerings. Oh, there's a sacrificial system before everything that we know for the Israelites and Mount Sinai and, oh goodness, huh? Perhaps Yahweh's always been pleased by a sacrificial system, okay? Maybe that's why it's going to happen again in a future age. Food for thought. But Yahweh does not correct Abraham. He, so he goes and he builds an altar. Now Isaac was bound up and laid on the altar. Most, most scholars that you read that are well-schooled in all these things, historically speaking, assess that Isaac was at the very least 25 years old. Um, Abraham was probably around 125. Okay, so like, let's just imagine this. This isn't a, a two-year-old <laughs> or even like an eight-year-old that, you know, come on, son, and you lift him up and you place him down. If, if in fact, um, Isaac was a young man, um, and, and Abraham was an old man, <laughs> um, most assuredly Isaac, on some level, was a willing participant in all of this. He, in a sense, was, I think it's safe to say, he was laying his life down, literally, upon this altar. And that, that will get to some of the imagery about Yeshua um, here in a little while. Well, let's do it now. There's so many things that point to Yeshua within this, like that. Isaac was the one and only son of Abraham in the sense of like, you know, the son whom he loved and the son that was given from Yahweh. Okay, there was, of course, uh, a venture, you could say, to try to force the, the promise um, that was all natural and messy and, and, and horribly wrong, which is, of course, a good pattern for all of us to remember when we try to get in there and force Yahweh's hand in a matter. But Isaac willingly laid his life down, it would seem. Um, and the event took place, began to follow the imagery of Yeshua, after three days. Okay? The sun is on the altar. And there, there's this timing and, and you know, deliverance and, and all, sacrifice and all these other things that are in, interwoven into this um, text. Now, I like this. This is a consideration. This is not fact now. A lot of stuff with Bible stuff, I love to wonder. I love to just, hmm. 
I, I know a little bit about like what was happening at this time and over here and at this time over here. I wonder if, okay, this is just a, a consideration. Now, we know that the priest Melchizedek um, was in the vicinity at this time, likely lived in, in this area. Now, some historians, whether you consider them out there or not, propose that it is at least plausible, okay? It's, it's remotely possible Then what if he was involved in this event? Just a wondering, okay? We're not told that. I'm not trying to add to Scripture. It's a wondering because of the imagery of the great high priest of a heavenly order and who Yeshua was as the only begotten son whom Yahweh loved, who fulfilled everything by laying down his life, sacrificially speaking, to become the great high priest in the line in order of Melchizedek, a, a heavenly priesthood. So you understand why that would even matter um, for our consideration. Um, Abraham built this altar. Um, we already talked about that just briefly a moment ago. Why did, he, why did he build an altar? How did he know to do that? How did he know what a burnt offering was? We're not told every single thing, friend, in the word of Elohim. We're told that, the, you know, there's not enough trees on the earth to make paper to record all of Yellow, Elohim's acts um, with mankind. Now, Moriah appears again in 2 Chronicles chapter 3 when Solomon begins the construction of the temple. Um, to quote that, where Yahweh had appeared to his father David. And so, okay, this place, there are places in the Bible, friend. This isn't um, sorcery or, or anything crazy. There are places on this earth that Yahweh met with men and became markers. We, if we follow Abraham's sojourning, you see memorials, right? You see men going and erecting an altar, and it became a memorial to Yahweh Elohim and his great name. And certain things happened at these certain places throughout generations, and this is one. Okay, Mount Moriah. Fast forward to the temple period. We know that sacrifices would take place right there, and Yahweh would dwell with his people. Okay, <laughs> like the dwelling and abode of Yahweh was coincidentally at this exact same location. Yeshua himself became what? The Lamb of Elohim that took away the sins of the world. John the Baptist declares that in John chapter 1. This, this imagery, okay? Coming up, well, part two. We're going to discuss this. We're going to discuss why Abraham approached this, this proposal the way that he did. And why I believe that he was full of faith. This, this is going to be the meat. We might have three parts, and the second part is going to be the meat of the sandwich here, of why I believe Abraham was able to do all these things we could, we could recall and expound on. Why did he get up early in the morning? Why did he go up there with such, almost it seems, it almost seems like anticipation. We don't see anything about dread or misery or... Oh, no, what if, what if God does this? There was a resolve about Abraham and a trust, a man of faith, friends. Why? Why was he this man of faith? I'm going to propose in the next part. He was a man of great faith. Again, this is where the redundancy comes in. Because he knew Yahweh's character. He knows that Yahweh will not operate outside the boundaries of his own law. Therefore, he could trust the process. Do you hear what I'm saying? All of this is not historical knowledge, friend. This is applicable for all of us right here, right now, wherever we are and whatever we're facing, individually now. Abraham could trust the process of what Yahweh was asking of him to test him all the way up to Genesis 22.10, taking the knife in his hand to slaughter his own son. Okay, so what did Abraham know that maybe we wouldn't have known in our ignorance and in our blind faith? Well, God said to go up the mountain, so that's what we're going to do. Bless God. God's good all the time. Oh, no, friends. This is a man of faith. So we're going to ask some more questions. How do we become men and women of faith in light of the account of Abraham? offering Isaac. You're watching the Path to Zion podcast. We're rediscovering the ancient way. 
Jump on board over at pathdesign.com. Check out the YouTube page for more recordings, of course. And uh, stay tuned for part two right after this. Amen.